Take you to school. I don't want to go to school, Daddy. Why not? I want to go to the city with you. <laughs> yes. And when you're old enough to go to the city with me every day, you know what? You'll wish you were back at school. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chester. Morning, Robbie. Come on, you. Off you go. And Jonathan, work hard. Come along, Jonathan. Mustn't keep Tom waiting. Where's Tom this morning? He's had to go to the dentist, miss. I hate the dentist. Do you like the dentist? No, not much. Tom, let's go start the car. The only way we can get him to school in the mornings. All right, miss. This way. Why? Less traffic. I never mind being late. Don't expect your teacher likes it, though. No, she doesn't. She's always ringing up when I'm late. You often late. I haven't been late for months.
Oh, damn. What's wrong? Drop my key. What key? It's the key to the garage door. I can't get the car in without it. Do you mind looking for it? It must be down there somewhere. Oh. <laughs> I found something. What? A half crown. Oh, well, you can keep that now. You go down there. You go and find my key. Come on, then. This isn't the school. No, but I've got to pick up another key. Like to help me look for it, would you? Yes. Yes. Does anybody live here? No, not at the moment. Key's upstairs. Do you want to see upstairs? Yes. Yes. Nice room, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Like a sweet, would you? Please. Yes, well, you come over here. I'll give you one, won't I? Here. Mind my fingers. All right? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go and uh, look for that key. You're going to be all right here, are you? I've been out for school. No, no, you won't. You come and look at this collywog. Come on. Pick it up, then. Do you like it, do you? Yes. Yes. It ticks. Oh, no, it ticks. It's special. I'm going to get that key, then. I'll come with you. No, you won't. I want my daddy. Yes, it is. Are you sure? Well, he left at the usual time. Like to speak to your daddy, would you? Yes. What's wrong, Robbie? It's Jonathan. He hasn't arrived at school. Hello? Hello? Like to say hello to your daddy, would you? Yes. Hello? Hello, Daddy. Jonathan, where are you? Daddy? Come on, give it to your uncle. It's quite safe. Who's that? I'm coming out to see you. I'll be there in half an hour.
What have you done with him? Tell me. I'll call the police. That would be a stupid thing to do. Marlon? Come inside. Now, don't worry. Everything will be all right. Killed in a car accident in Scotland, wasn't she? I wanted you to know I just didn't get your name out of the telephone directory. How much money do you want? I suppose I should have expected a businessman to be businesslike. How much? I've been watching this house for some time. That's how I knew about the car hire routine. I just called him up this morning. Tell them Jonathan had a cold, he wouldn't be going to school. Simple. Look, Marlow, you didn't come here to tell me how clever you are. I want my son back, and as soon as possible. Now, how much money do you want? Fifty thousand pounds. Where is he? He's quite safe. <laughs> Reed Hampstead. You sure he's still in the house? Address? Your name? Robinson. Right. Just keep calm. We'll send somebody over straight away. Jackson. Yes, sir. Take over this desk here for a minute, will you? Right. Suspected kidnapping case has just come in, sir. Address? Chester. Anthony Chester. Well, that'd be him, sir. Did he report it? No, sir, the nanny, Miss Robinson. She was a little hysterical. She said the kidnapper was in the house. Priority. Get Miss Scotland Yard. Here it is. Yes. How long ago? I'll give me the address. Yes. All right, I'll get somebody onto it right away. In the meantime, send a cue car down. Tell them not to go inside. Watch the house and keep out of sight. Look, you better make it two cars. If anyone leaves the house, have them followed. Yes, sir? Who's the duty detective inspector? Inspector Parnell, sir. Well, give me Parnell's office. Yes? Parnell there. Uh, not at the moment, sir. He's at Cannon Row. The smash and grab job. 14 Winnington Road, N2. Suspected kidnapping case. The local police are keeping the house under observation. I want Parnell to drop everything and get over there right away. Yes, sir. Cannon Row. Inspector Parnell, right away. It's urgent. Last. I want a car now. Entrance B. How's the memory, Smalley? Coming back, is it? Well, let's give it a little jog, shall we? Now, you were the lookout. You were standing outside the shop when the car drives up. Stolen, of course. You didn't steal it, did you, Smiley? No. Well, it was stolen. That's something established. Now, one man stayed in the driving seat. That was Jerry Saunders. The other... I'm admitting nothing. Jerry Saunders was seen. We'll pick him up sooner or later. 
In the meantime, you're going to help us fit the last piece of the puzzle into place. The man who got out of the car. The man who smashed that window and took all that very expensive jewelry. That's the man we want, isn't it? What's his name, Smiley? Are you frightened, Smiley? What are you frightened of? The man was wearing a grey overcoat with a collar turned up, dark hair. He's the one you're frightened of, isn't he? He's the one who promised you a going over if you talked. Well, you tell us who he is, we'll pick him up and send him to prison. He can't hurt you in there, can he? He's got friends. We'll protect you. You don't have to worry about them. Don't I? They'll smash my face in and you know it. <laughs> You don't know how you are, you smiley. You don't have to rush off anywhere, do you? I've got plenty of time. I want to know something, I just go on and on till I get the right answer. Relentless, that's what I am. Cigarette? <coughs> Who was he, smiley? The other man, the man you're frightened of. Who was he? His name. And when you're wasting time, smiley, I want to know who he is. His name. <coughs> You're frightened of him, I'll make you damn sight more frightened of me. His name, Smiley, his name. Would you like to go, Smiley? Go on, off you go. Those friends of yours, the ones you're so frightened of, they'll, uh, they'll probably be waiting outside for you. You think they're going to believe you haven't squealed? They've all been here before. They know what happens if you don't talk. You're kept in here. It's only the ones that tell us what we want to know are allowed out. I mean, they know that you know who that man is. They'll think we know it, too. Well, away you go, Smiley. Tom Laker. Tom Laker, get a warrant out for his arrest. Have a call put out and pick him up. Is he? Just finished. You feel like a drive over to Hampstead? No, not today. Meeting the wife for lunch. What about him? Book him for withholding information. Lock him up. You better start thinking about sandwiches. We've got work to do. There's a car waiting outside. Yeah, anything less than murder can wait till after lunch. Kidnapping. Two chicken and one salami. I'll see you in the car. Right. It's always an emergency. Riverside 1707. Hello? Maggie, can't make it for lunch tomorrow, huh? I seem to have heard that somewhere before. Uh, yesterday. This time I promised faithfully, cross my heart and hope to die. Well, don't die before tonight. We've got friends coming. I promised them you'd be here. Well, order the caviar. I'll be home on the dot of six. Goodbye. Bye. This is chicken? That's what the man said. Bought fresh today. This one must have followed him home. Tough. Very. Fill me in on this case, will you? Suspected kidnapping. The locals are already there, keeping an eye on the place. Is that all? At the moment. Who put me onto this? Muley. When did it come in? About ten minutes ago. Sounds like a bastard. Muley always drops those like a hot brick. Well, let's hope this time he keeps out of it. Let's me handle it my own way. If it's as tricky as it sounds, you won't see him till the press conference. <laughs> One thing he is good at. As a policeman, he photographs well. At the house? Yes. That's the kidnapper's car on the driveway. He used it to pick the boy up this morning. Closing is the hired car that takes him to school. He's left the boy somewhere and come back to get the money. What's the boy's name? Jonathan. His father is Anthony Chester. Now, he left the house about 15 minutes ago. The other Q car followed him to a bank in the city. They just radioed Q. 
He's drawing out 50,000 pounds. Give us the facts a bit, wouldn't it? Who phoned the police? Robinson. She's the nanny. It sounds like Chester didn't know she's phoned. It sounds like it. Incidentally, the kidnapper gave his name as Marlowe. Hmm? Give back to the yard. It's a neat transport they can do. Too easy. Marlowe stays in the house. Chester goes to the bank for the money. Why the bank? Why not the police station? Why did Marlowe come to the house at all? Good point. I like the old-fashioned demand notes tied around a brick and thrown to the window. Anonymous telephone calls made from a call box. That I can understand. He's taking too much of a risk. Crooks are lazy bastards. That's why they're crooks. He's working too hard for his money. Try a character analysis. He's industrious, clever, courageous, obviously convincing. A hell of a boy for getting money out of people. He's a crook. Doesn't add up. He should be charged with the exchequer. This is his car. Better get sent back to the yard and have it thoroughly checked. I doubt if it'll do any good, but I'm going in to have a little chat with Mr. Marlowe. Show him your badge. You break down and confess everything. He's virtually done that already. What interests me is how he thinks he's going to get away with it. Inspector Parnell, CID. Please come in. He's in there, in the study. Does he know the police have been called? No. Get a couple of men posted around the back, just in case he gets nervous and decides to pull out without letting us know. Look, show me into the study. Don't say anything, then go and wait in the kitchen, all right? Waiting for Chester, are you? I'm waiting for him. I got business with him. Shouldn't take long. Not in a hurry, are you? I'll be leaving a few minutes after he gets back. My business is confidential. I'm thinking. Yes? I'm working out a problem. Are you any good at problems? You might be able to help me. Anyone can kidnap a child. That's easy. Just walk out in the street, grab them, put them away. Some of the police won't be able to find them. Simple. Well, now we come to the tricky bit. Collecting the money and getting away with it. Let's be more specific. How do we exchange the child for the money and get out before the police catch up with you? We won't be needing the police. You won't be needing that money, Mr. Chester. You've got to let Marlowe go. Tell him. There's little boys in a room somewhere in London. He's playing with a gollywog. Inside the gollywog's a time bomb. Just like this one. Bomb's set to go off exactly 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. I'll set this one. One minute. I got a plane ticket to Rio. Once I get there, nobody can touch me. I take the money with me. I get on the afternoon plane. Should reach there about 7 o'clock tomorrow morning, our time. I'll book through a call to this number so I can let you know where the boy is. You'll have plenty of time to get him out and dismantle the bomb. Principle of the bomb's very simple. Works like an ordinary alarm clock. When the mechanism reaches the time for detonation, it releases a capsule containing acid onto a thin metal plate. This, in turn, burns through the plate, makes the electrical contact, releases the charge. The acid's been released. It'll take uh, 20 seconds to burn through. You bastard. There's enough explosive in the proper bomb to blow the side of the house off. Now perhaps you'll see why you've got to let him go. Yeah. Gray. Have a look. Come here in a moment, will you? <laughs> Get this down to the lab. I want to check thoroughly. D 
Details of how it works. Special attention to the timing device and method of detonation. I want to know where the components came from. Well, I should sit down, gentlemen. We're going to be here for some time. Marlowe's going. He's taking the money, and he's going. He stays. If I don't bring charges against this man, you can't arrest him. Or stop him leaving the country. I don't need the police involved in this. But we are involved. That's our job. The man's a criminal. He's committed a criminal offence. I'm a policeman. I don't like that. He's going to jail. At first, he's going to tell us where he's hitting your son. And you're wrong about arresting him. I can do that any time I like. You're also wrong about him leaving the country. He's not even going to leave this house. All right, I've not got time to waste arguing with you. I'm going to have you taken off this case. Go ahead. What rank do you hold? Detective Inspector. Scotland Yard, I want Assistant Commissioner Bewley. It's Anthony Chester speaking. Bewley? Chester here. All right. Tell Parnell I'm coming over. Straight away. Thank you. The Assistant Commissioner is on his way over. Got the report back on the car. There's only the two sets of prints, Marlowe's and the boys. We checked Marlowe's against the file. There's no record. There's nothing in the car that's any help. It was hired a week ago. Firm in Nutty Hill Gate. He gave the name Marlowe, false address, paid the deposit in cash and drove off. The owner doesn't even remember what he looks like, which is understandable. He hires about 50 cars a day. Shall I repeat all that? Would you prefer a short pricey? Investigations on car. Dead loss. Marlowe's got the boy tucked away somewhere in a house in London. He's given him a gollywog to play with. It's very considerate of him. Inside the gollywog, there's a bomb set to go off at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Marlowe's thinking in terms of the afternoon flight to Rio and phoning back to tell us where the boy is. He takes the money with him. Chester's willing to let him go and pay up. I'm not. Conflict. Chester's going over my head. It appears that he knows somebody at the yard. Probably met him at a hunt ball. I'll give you three guesses who it is. Not the most photogenic assistant commissioner in the business. The same. He's on his way over here now. Jess is going to ask him to take me off the case. Quite like old times. What do you want me to do? Arrest him as he steps out of the car. We could probably get him with a parking offence. Take him around the back if you like and wring his neck. It'll save me a lot of trouble. Gray, I'll tell you something. Julie took me off a case once before. He's never going to do that to me again. <laughs> Just a moment, Parnell. I want to talk to Chester alone. I'll call you when I want you. That's what I like about the police force. The informal relationship that exists between all ranks. One day soon, I'm going to tell that crawler something that's going to knock his ears off. We write to the Citizens Advice Bureau about him. Our superior officer is a social climber. He goes so far up, he should have his initials carved on the soles of his boots. What about Marlowe and his gollywog? Sounds like he's round the bend. Oh, don't underestimate him. He's clever. It's not like catching a normal criminal. They get frightened. This fellow's prepared for anything. Do you think you can get him to talk? He's got a weakness underneath that self-assurance. May take a little time to find it, but it's there. It's always there. You know, you can spend hours questioning someone, getting nowhere, covering the same old ground over and over again, searching for that one phrase, that one word that'll spark them off. When you find it, it's like hitting a nerve. It splits open. Before you know what's happened, they're screaming it all out at you. And all you can do is phone the desk sergeant and tell him to take over. Sounds an interesting job. Any vacancies? Marlow will break. They all do in time. You haven't got much time. Well, I'll leave you with one thought. I'm with you anyway. Whatever you decide to do, I'll stick by you. 
but don't get bogged down. By refusing to let Marlowe go, who are you protecting? The boy? Or is it a straight fight between you and Bewley? You believe this story about the bomb? Yes, I've seen the demonstration model. We have one fact to go on. Chester talked to his son and Marlowe half an hour before Marlowe got here. Well, that means the boy can't be very far away. Still means we have a large area to cover, doesn't it? You don't think there's a hope of locating the boy by ordinary routine methods? Well, a very lucky break, no. Do you think Marlowe will talk? Yeah. Are you certain? No, I'm not certain, but I think he'll talk. It's taking a hell of a chance. I'll make him talk. I have to. We could let Marlowe go. I'm not prepared to do that. Well, you better face the fact that we might have to. I'll make him talk. Look, Parnell, there's one thing I want you to get clear. I've got a job to do as well as you, and it isn't an easy one. My first concern must be the child. Is that what Chester told you to say? Chester? Well, he's a friend of yours, isn't he? An influential friend. The sort of friend you've cultivated deliberately all your life. I should like to leave the personal issues out of this. Yeah, so would I. I don't think we can. It's Chester's son we're concerned with. I don't care whose son it is. I'm going to tell you to let Marlowe go. You're ordering me to let Marlowe go? You let him go. I hope you know what you're doing. But I'll tell you one thing, Bewley. Sooner or later, this story's going to break in the newspapers. That's one press conference that you're welcome to. What the hell are you talking about? The headlines. How to break the law and get away with it. Why don't you take out an ad? All you need is a bomb, a child, and someone to put them. From there on, you get full police cooperation. They'll personally escort you to the nearest airport with 50,000 pounds. I want you to let Marlowe go. You know, what interests me is what you do next time this happens. You're handing out a kidnapping license to every dirty little would-be crook in the country. When they find out this fellow got away, they'll all be queuing up to climb on the bandwagon. What you do then, Bewley? Do you let the next one go and the next? Where does it stop? We can keep this out of the papers. For how long? Now, come on, Bewley. You know more about the papers than most people. You'll never keep this quiet. Apart from the people that know already, the police and the nanny, what about Chester? With his boy locked up with a time bomb, the money's not important. But later, when and if he gets his son home safely, that money's going to start hurting him. He's going to want to do something about it. I don't care how rich he is, he's going to try and get his 50,000 quid back. That's when the story breaks. I'm sorry, Parnell. We'll have to chance that. The one thing we can't take a chance on is letting that little boy die. Don't you see? That's what he's banking on. That's why he didn't do it the conventional way. That's why he's sitting confidently in the other room, hoping he's got someone like you in charge. Someone will get frightened and want to let him go. Holding on to Marlowe is too big a risk. It's part of our job taking risks. Every time a policeman walks into a room unarmed and faces a loaded revolver, he's taking a risk. That boy is an innocent member of the public. It's our job to save his life. A policeman does his job because he's paid for doing it. Nobody faces a loaded gun for 15 quid a week. It's not just that. Look, Bewley, I've been a copper for nearly 20 years. Not for the money, but because I believe in the law. I've stopped kids playing football in the streets on a Sunday, not because I think it's wrong, because it's against the law. That's our book, that's what we live by. If you let somebody break the law and get away scot-free, you're weakening every policeman everywhere. They'll all believe just a little bit less in what they're doing. They'll all take just a little less risk, because we said to a self-confessed criminal, we know you're a kidnapper, we know you've broken the law, but you can pack your bags, take your money and go. Now you think of that before you decide. I know what's in the book as well as you do. But sometimes we have to go outside the book and do what we think is right. Well, for once, Bewley, you're facing a loaded revolver. It's easy for you to step out of the way, push the rules to one side, because this time it's inconvenient. The law says that Marlowe is a criminal. Your job as a policeman is to make him talk, make him tell us where the boy is. Not to run away from it and cheat yourself into taking the easy way out. All right, Parnell. You've had your say. I've listened to you, and now as your superior officer, I've made my decision. Let Marlowe go. I've made my decision, too. As long as I'm in charge of this case, I have no intention of releasing Marlowe. Let me say it for you, Bewley. You have no other alternative but to take me off the case. I'm sorry about this, Parnell. Don't be. You've done it before. You're also saving yourself a lot of trouble and possible embarrassment next time you happen to be out to dinner with Chester or some of his friends. But you're doing something else, too, Bewley. You're personally taking responsibility for the safety of Chester's son. You see, Bewley, it might not be the easy way out. Marla may be playing it dead safe. He may have already killed the boy. I thought you believed Marlowe's story. You know how many kidnappers start up as kidnappers and become murderers? 
For every child we get back alive, three will be dead when they're found. They got troublesome, they cried at the wrong time. They could identify places and people. I mean, I believe Marlowe's story, but we can't afford to ignore the possibilities. Admittedly, I can't guarantee that I can make Marlowe talk. But can you guarantee that you can make him phone from Rio and tell us where the boy is? Once he's safely out of the country, he'll have nothing to lose by telling us. Nothing to gain, either. You know, I learned something very early on. Never apply to a criminal the same standards you would to yourself. They're not reasonable people. Now, take this man, for instance. He admits he's locked a little boy in a room with a time bomb sewn inside a gollywog. Does that sound like a reasonable man to you? It's an odd man, a nut. Nobody knows what he'll do, what he won't do. I wouldn't stake a penny on the possibility of him phoning from anywhere at any time. I've ordered you to let Marlowe go. I think that's the right thing to do. You've refused. Fine. Handle the case your way. But I want you to get one thing clear. You take responsibility for that boy's safety. If anything goes wrong, I hold you personally responsible. If there are any developments, I expect you to contact me at once. You can forget your trip to Rio. The money goes back to the bank. You stay. You'll change your mind. Maybe. In the meantime, I'm going to caution you to now officially under arrest. Anything you say will be taken down and used as evidence. You're held on a charge of kidnapping. Would you like to make a statement? What do you expect me to do? Give you a confession or something? No, just a statement. Now you're talking as if it's all over. It's not. Boy's in a room with a bomb. Bomb's due to go off at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning to blow him to pieces. In that case, we'll charge you with murder. Now you get it all wrong. I'll offer you a straight agreement. You give me the money, let me go. I'll tell you where the boy is. The offer's been turned down. You don't have to make a statement if you don't want to. It's up to you. I'm not going to make you no statement. Good. That saves me the trouble of taking it all down in longhand anyway. It's only fair to warn you that if that boy dies, they'll hang you. You're going to let him die, are you? Well, you decide that. You're the only one who knows where he is. I'm not going to tell you where the boy is. So I've gathered. You know... I was watching this house for some time. Hard to make up my mind what would happen if somebody called the police. You know what my reaction to that would be. I decided I'd stick to my terms. So either you give me the money and you let me go to Rio, or the little boy will die. It's as simple as that. Pleasant house, this. This room in particular. A lot of thought going into it. Hey, you got a hand to the chest, he's got taste all right. You got to have a, an eye for furniture to conceive a room like this. Yeah. Also need a lot of money, don't you? Very true. How much would you say this desk is worth? It's antique, isn't it? Don't know nothing about antiques. Well, take a guess. 100 quid? I don't know. Well, how much would you say all the furniture in this room is worth? Seven fifty thousand pounds? I really couldn't say. How much that suit cost you? I'd say it's about eight or nine years old. I'll take a plunge at ten quid, am I right? Well, that's good material. Yeah, that's the trouble with suits. Doesn't matter how good the material is if the style's not there. I take Chester suit, for instance. Now, you can see that's handmade, it's well cut, it's got a good line to it. Well... What to be with all his money. You don't like that, do you? The fact he's got all that money. Good luck to him. What about Chester's son? Do you resent the fact all that money will rub off on him? Don't bother me. Why did you put that bomb inside a gollywog? My plane leaves 5.30. That's about three and a half hours from now. Did you buy the ticket or just reserve it? Oh, I reserved it. I pay for it at the airport. Yeah, with, the, uh, with the money you take from Chester? Oh, yeah. How did you learn about bombs? I mean, how did you know how to make that time bomb? Don't worry. It'll work all right. I don't doubt it. But where did you learn how to make it? I made it. That's enough. But why did you put it in a gollywog? No particular reason. Oh, there's always a reason. You put it in a gollywog. Why? Don't know why. You must have gone out specially to look for one. You must have had a reason. No, I just happened to see it in the shop. You also made a point of telling us it was a gollywog. 
And you could have said it was a toy or just simply said you left the bomb in the room. You made a point of telling us that the bomb was in the gully one. So what? Well, I'm trying to find an explanation. It would have been much simpler and much safer to put it in a cupboard or hidden it somewhere. I mean, you said yourself, the bomb's powerful enough to blow the side of a house up. No need to go to all that trouble. I like gollywogs. Would have been more natural to chose something you didn't like. All right, then I don't like gollywogs. I expect you had one when you were a child, didn't you? You're banking on the fact that Chester's little boy will do the same thing to as you did, carry it around and always have it near him. Anything you say. You're a weird, you are. <laughs> Who gave it you? Was it your mother? Why do you resent Chester's son? Why should I resent him? Because you weren't so well off when you were a child. You didn't live in surroundings like these. Who did give it to you? Was it your mother? I remember. Perhaps your mother gave it to you for your birthday, huh? I don't remember. I've mentioned your mother three times now. Each time you've avoided talking about her. Why? I'll leave off, will you? Are you ashamed of her? My mother and my father are both dead. They were killed in the Blitz. Were you in London during the war? Yeah. Where'd you live? West London. Parents killed by a bomb? Yeah. Or dropped on the house? Yeah. Where were you? Why weren't you killed? Well, I was with a friend, wasn't I? Where? In the country. What's your father do? He's in business. Your mother help him? Yes. What kind of business? You didn't like the business they ran, eh? It was their life, not mine. Did your father like you? Yeah, reasonable. Same build? <laughs> yes, same build. So your mother ran the business and your father helped? Can't remember. Your mother did give you that gollywog, didn't she? I don't know. Well, someone gave it to you. It was your mum, wasn't it? Why don't you go and ask her? I thought she was dead. My plane leaves at 5.30. You want to save the little boy's life, I'd better be on it. I can't help you. I'm a policeman. I've got to stick by the law. The law says you stay here and stand trial for kidnapping. Maximum penalty, 12 years. Ah, oh, thank you. You know me, child, Marlowe. Yeah. I had a very happy childhood. Nobody kicked me around. Did you ever met Chester before today? No, never. Well, how'd you know about him? Well, I read about him in the papers. How'd you find his address? Directory of Directress. Public library. You working entirely alone? No outside help? Well, I don't need any outside help. What you do for a living? Accounts clerk. In the city? Yeah, it won't help you to know where it was, sir. I expect you're very good at your job, aren't you? Accurate, precise, well organized. Didn't like it much, sir. So you decided to retire at someone else's expense. Well, how's it feel to have someone's life in your hands, eh? A small boy who doesn't even know you. He's never done you any harm, probably even trusts you. My plane leaves 5.30. I've got to be there at five to check in. That's the little boy's mother. Yeah, I know that. Funny thing about mothers, you're always inclined to compare them to other people's, but they never seem to match up somehow. Perhaps it's because you know your own mother so well. Look at that portrait, Marlowe. Go on, look at it. Did your mother ever have a portrait painted? No. Why not? Put your mother in that fray. She's in this room now. Does she have the same elegance, the same poise, the same dignity? Are you proud to look up and see her sitting there judging you? What's she saying, Marlowe? Are those eyes cold and bitter? Is she ashamed of you? Is the mouth hard and straight and condemning? What is it that's staring out at you? Benevolence or disgust? Affection or revulsion? Which is it, Marlowe? She wouldn't give a damn. Why not? Working clothes, working hands, there's nothing to go by. She's your mother. She brought you up, fed you, clothed you. She worked hard for her money. Yeah, she used to spend it all on herself. She used to drink it every night. Ah, oh, she gave you things. She gave you that golly one. Yeah, she gave me the golly one. Coming to my room with it like one night. Present she bought in a pub. Stinking of a drink. I had to kiss her for it. And she took me down to see all her friends, all laughing, you know, all stinking of spirits. People being sick, all laughing, all pouring all over me. Yes. 
She think I'm in the county walk. The boy didn't do this to you. Don't take it out on him. Now, we'll go and pick him up, shall we? There'll be no case against you. I'll see that you're looked after. Where's the boy, Marlowe? What's the address? All right, Parnell, you've had long enough. Now, let him go. I want my son back. Tell him, man, tell him he can take the money and he can go. Look, there's 50,000 pounds in that case. If you let him go now, I'll give you the same amount. Found. Parnell. Parnell. Learn something, Chester. You can buy Marlow, you can buy Buell, you might even be able to buy me. One thing you can't buy is your son's life. Marlow gets on a plane. It could be delayed, diverted, it might even crash. He has to drive to the airport. There could be a car accident. What are you going to do about that? Take out an insurance policy? Anything can happen once Marlow leaves this house. He's the only man who can save your son's life. Once he's here, under our control, we have a chance. You tell us where the boy is. I can still get that plane. You won't have seen one of these bombs go off. I did my national service in Cyprus. I was a clerk there. I used to have to keep track of all the troop movements, where they kept the tanks, the bombs, where the ammunition was, so forth. They used to have these big conferences. Right in the heat of the trouble, they had one of these big conferences. Due to start just after lunch. Well, two of the generals were delayed, so the conference was held up. One of these terrorists, he put a bomb inside an attaché case in the conference room. There was only an orderly in there when it went off. They didn't find enough of him to bury. Where is he? Where's my son? Doctor, now you know the circumstances. Can't you just pump something in to bring him round? I don't know yet. I'm afraid it isn't possible just to pump something into him to bring him round. This man's suffering from a very serious concussion. I want him moved to hospital as soon as possible so that I can examine him thoroughly, get some x-rays made. I suspect a dangerous fracture of the skull, probably some damage to the brain, too. Doctor, I'm a rich man, very rich. I want you to get the best brain surgeon in the country to see this man, operate on him. Do anything you like, but get him round tonight. I can certainly arrange a consultation with the best man available. If necessary, I can arrange for emergency operating facilities. But I have to warn you, Mr. Chester, it might not be possible to do anything to bring this man round in the time we have. You understand, I don't care how much money it costs. Just get him conscious. We'll do our best. How long will it be before you know anything, Doctor? I'll get the x-rays done immediately. 
soon as I've seen them, I'll contact you. Where will you be? I'm going back to the yard. I'll rather be there, and my office will know where I am. I'll ring you as soon as I've got something. I want a plain clothes man to sit by Marlowe. I don't want to left alone for a minute. If he gets delirious, he may talk about the boy. Mightn't he? Yes. Yes, he might. Get that circulated to all the papers. I want a copy on the front page of every morning paper. Right. In the meanwhile, I want Marlowe's clothes checked for any laundry marks. I doubt if Marlowe's his real name. Might help when you the right one. Jenkins is over at the hospital. He can do that right away. Good. Now, my guess is that he's rented the house or flat that he's put the boy into. He got there in half an hour. That means it's somewhere in the London area. Get onto every estate agent in the book. Check whether they've rented anything recently to anyone of Marlowe's description. If they're not sure from the description, get a copy of the picture to them. That's going to take weeks. Well, we haven't got weeks. We've got hours. Get started right away. Get all the help you need. Right. Get me Mr. Bewley. Mr. Bewley's not in his office. Well, find him for me, will you? Has Inspector Parnell left yet? It's your wife. Look, I won't be able to get there for dinner. In fact, I don't know when I'll get home. Expect me when you see me. Doctor, there's someone to see you. It's all right, nurse. Come in, Mr. Chester. Just got the x-rays. How bad is it? Very bad, I'm afraid. This is the place that's fractured. There's a piece of bone pressing into the brain. We'll have to remove it. But I don't think we can operate on him in his present condition. A specialist seen him yet? No, I'm waiting for him now. You mind if I wait? No, of course not. Scotland Yard, please. Oh, Parnell here. All right, thank you, Doctor. Anything? Waiting for the specialist. Doesn't sound very hopeful. Information for any cars in the vicinity of West in the Some maniac thinks there's been an invasion. Probably the pubs just closed. Right, have a car waiting for Something for you, Gray, just coming from there. Anything in from the patrol cars, yeah? Do you expect anything? Why don't you start looking for a boy in a house somewhere in London? Try and get some good news next time, will you? Got some more for you. Had to take two cars off your patrol list. What the hell for? Well, one of them's been out for ten hours without a break, and the other's gone off to investigate a suicide at Clapham Bridge. We're not the only bloody case going on here, you know. Look, we're priority. Everybody's priority. That word's just an excuse to keep people waking 24 hours a day. I'll put that car back on your case as soon as they've picked up the pieces. Great. Have you been able to contact Mr. Bewley yet? Mr. Bewley's not at home, sir. When's he expected back? They don't know. Well, keep trying, will you? We got the report back on the bomb. They tested it in the lab. It's dead accurate. What about the materials? You can get them anywhere. Chemist shop, hardware store. It's dead accurate, eh? 
And it's due to blow up at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Any idea how long it'll be before he comes round? Possible to say. He may come round at once, he may not come round for days. One thing is certain, he cannot be operated on to relieve the pressure on his brain in his present condition. We just wait. Yes. I'll tell Chester. Scotland Yard, please. Farnell. Well, thank you anyway, Doctor. Good night. The specialist says nothing doing. I don't know when there will be. Huh? Mr. Buell is still not home, sir. Okay. You should know better. I suppose I should. This is a case gone wrong. You won't get near Buell till it's all over. Gray. What do you think? Marlowe's a coward. He would have broken. Do you know what I'd have done? I'd have brought him back to the yard and beaten the living daylights out of him until he told me where the boy was. Seventeen. Hold on. Give me that information. Yes. Thank you. Right. You take this call, will you? Hello. Information. Would you give me, Sergeant Gray? One of the laundry marks paid off. A Mrs. Maddox, 137 Westbourne Road, Paddington. After time. You heard me open the door. You're too late. We're closed. Oh. I'm looking for Mrs. Maddox. Who do you want? Are you Mrs. Maddox? That's me. That's right. Everyone calls me Maisie. I don't know why. My name's Dorothy. Have a drink? Scotch, please. Well. What do you want? Five shillings, please. You know these coppers are our guests, and we can't charge for drinks at this time of night. Pay no attention to him. It's just my husband, Freddie. That's right. How'd you do? Do you know him? Of course we know him. That's our son, George, isn't it, Freddie? That's right. Does he live here? No, he doesn't. No, not for a long time. Years. Does he come around? Only when you want something. No, he wasn't always like that. Used to always bring me things. Now, you know that's true, ain't it, Freddy? That's right. He never came without a present for his old mum. Then he stopped bringing them. What sort of things? Gullywogs. Every time he came, he used to bring me different ones. Always gullywogs? He loved them. I gave him one once, see? It was Christmas. Fred and I was in a pub crawl. And there was this man, and he had this gollywog, see? So I thought, well, I have got a present for George, and kids like presents, especially at Christmas. So I went up to this man. Now, at first, he wasn't going to send it to me. Then I said, I don't care what it costs. I want it. I got it. I'm like that when I make up my mind, aren't I, Freddy? That's right. And when we got home, it was late. And I went up to his room, and I woke him up. And he never forgot it. He loved gollywogs. <sighs> when did you last see him? About three months ago. 
Do you know where he lives? No idea. I believe he used to live somewhere over Highgate Way, but uh, that was three or four years ago. Well, how often does he come in? Not much. We never know when he is coming. Just drops in, has a couple on the house. If he's got any more money, he buys a few more, and if not, I tell him he can't have any more free, and then he hops it. Oh, no, he never was much of a drinker. I mean, he didn't bother if he didn't have one. More for the company. Couldn't make friends easy. Did he have any friends around here? Not that I remember. What about girlfriends? I never saw any. And you've no idea where he would be living now? No. Oh, he may be popping sometime. Uh, shall I tell him you was asking for him? Uh, don't bother. Have another drink. No, thanks. On the house? Funny thing. What? They didn't even ask what we wanted him for. My son is. Marla, look, I'll see you get away all right and you'll get the money on it. Tell me where Jonathan is. Marla, where's Jonathan? Oh, my God. For God's sake, man, tell me, where's Jonathan? Tell me. Marla. 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 He can't hear you and he can't answer you. He's in a coma. He's very dangerously ill. He can't help you. I want my son back. Well, keep at it. Well, so what? We all need sleep. Doctor? Doctor, could you come in, please? I hear you've been trying to contact me. You asked to be kept informed. I've been getting hourly reports direct from the information room. Good. Then you'll be up to date with the situation. Yes, and I'm not very pleased with it. Who is? Chester's been on to the commissioner. The commissioner's asked for a full inquiry and he's asked me to handle it. Great. When do we start? I don't think I like your attitude. Don't you realize that this is serious? Serious? I know just how serious it is. I've been working on this case all day. Time is passing. We haven't found the boy. As far as I can see, we're nowhere near to finding him. That's just how serious it is. What's the latest from the hospital? Very unlikely to be able to talk. So what do we do? Look, I've got every man that can be spared, making every possible routine inquiry. i found Marlowe's parents, I've seen them, I've talked to them. Well? No, nothing doing. All we can do is wait and hope that one of the routine inquiries pays off. Someone, somewhere, must know this man. If one of my men gets someone to recognize that photograph, it might lead somewhere. Until that happens, we wait. It's tough on Chester. I feel very sorry for Chester. I also feel very sorry for Chester's son. I'm full of feelings of sorrow for everybody involved in this case. When you came in, I was even beginning to feel sorry for myself. 
Hello, Parnell. Yes? Oh, God. Yes, I'm sure you did, Doctor. Thank you. Marlowe died two minutes ago without regaining consciousness. Now you haven't a hope in hell of finding that boy. That's a fair assessment of the situation. And how do you suggest I tell the Commissioner about this? Well, that's your problem. Personally, I'm not interested. Then you better start getting interested. Then quickly. He's already asked me to find out why you kept Marlowe in Chester's house. Why you allowed Marlowe and Chester to remain alone together. Why you let this whole situation get out of hand. I handled the case the way I thought best. I wanted to question Marlowe in those particular surroundings for a particular reason. What reason? Uh, it's not important now. I thought I could break him there more easily than I could in the local police station. You fancy yourself as a psychologist, don't you, Parnell? The man who could make anybody talk. And that's all very well as long as it works. But when it goes wrong, you've got to be prepared to accept the consequences. I'd much rather discuss this some other time, when we've either found the boy or not found him. In the meantime, if you're going to see the Commissioner in the morning, I suggest you go home and change. I don't think you'd be very pleased with a dinner jacket in the cold light of early dawn. Playboy of the Western world doing here? Slumming. Oh, no, we've got something. An estate agent in Chiswick. I recognize him from his picture in the paper. He was in here about two weeks ago. I'm sure it's the same man. Did he rent a house from you? I think so. I don't deal with houses. Mr. Tamplin handles that side of it. Where's he? He's usually here about 9.45. What's his home number? Westlow 5456. Ring him. If this man, his name is probably Marlowe, maybe Maddox, rented a house from you, he'd be in the files. Well, that's locked. Have you got a key? Oh, yes, but Mr. Tamplin wouldn't... Come like... on, open it up. Tamplin's left his home. He's on his way. Yeah. These are the recent lettings. It'll be in here. A Marlowe or Maddox, you said? Yes. I'm afraid there's nothing in here with those names. Well, what about the dates? Can you remember which day he was in here? Certainly sometime in the last three weeks. Well, how many houses you let in the last three weeks? I really couldn't say. Could it be a flat? Could be. Ah, oh, here's Mr. Tamplin now. Mr. Tamplin, we're police officers. Did you let a house or flat to this man? Yes, Abbott's Mead. A detached house on three floors at Wimbledon. Take me there. Yes, sir. Follow instructions from Mr. Tamplin. How much further? About five minutes at this rate.
Later. Thank you. I saw Mr. Fisker is anxious to get it somewhere over as soon as possible. Oh, yes, sir. That's all right. Don't worry, sir. Come along now. Now stand back, boys. I'll give you a full statement later. Thank you very much, sir. Well, yeah. <laughs> Julie, you'll be sure to thank Inspector Parnell for me. Good show, Parnell. Want to talk to the press? I'm going home to sleep for a week. You talk to them. You're better at it than I am. There's still one or two things to sort out. Will you be at the yard later? Go to hell. I want to see you in my office first thing tomorrow morning. May I have a statement now, Mr. Dooley, regarding this matter? Yes, sir. Good night. Get you some breakfast. <laughs> 